How do you like this new test format of the next PowerPoint version? Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> so, first of all, this, this presentation was prepared by Andy Eichen, and I am not Andy, I am Glenn. Yeah, you see, that's why he's not here. <laughs> so, um, I have a copy of Andy's file, which maybe we can use and maybe not. But I know the story, so I will tell you anyway. I don't know. I don't know, but I think we don't have time. So, um, Andy is my, uh, my business partner with Language of Liberty Institute. Andy is coming from the airport, so maybe Andy will arrive, and he, then I have to stop and, and he can talk. But I will tell you a little bit about Andy's presentation, and then I have some comments my, myself. I have a file, and I think my file is much better. <laughs> so, um, can we just start? You can just start to play the file. Yeah, yeah, don't worry, it's okay. And so you, your brains are much better than the computer so, and your eyes, so you can just adjust this. I think the important information is here. Uh, I'm going to talk really briefly and hope that Andy comes so he can add more comments because I want you to meet him also. I would, Andy, Andy wants to tell you about the, the story of Language of Liberty Institute. We, we were founded 10 years ago, so uh, this is our, our 10th year, our 10th anniversary. We are incorporated as a non-profit corporation in the U.S., in the state of Arizona, where I live. I live in Phoenix. So, this is our website. Well, our website looks better than that. But, uh, languageofliberty.org. And maybe you wonder where the name comes from. What do we mean, language of liberty? Why did we choose this? It means many things, but first, the language of liberty means the English language. Because at this point in history, if you can speak English, you have more opportunity in life, and therefore, more freedom. And you know this, and you're all English speakers, and probably one reason you're here, besides hearing the wonderful speakers, you, uh, it's an opportunity to practice English and learn more English. So our programs are, uh, are done in English and most of our students are not native English speakers. English is their second or third or fourth language as for many of you. We don't teach English, our students already know English but they're looking for practice. Their English is probably not as good as yours. Uh, they're not fluent but they are looking for more practice. Second meaning, language of liberty is what we're calling classical liberal thought, classical liberal philosophy, or libertarian philosophy. We don't normally say libertarian because the word means many different things to many people. In the US, in fact, the term is now so familiar, which is good, that all Americans know about libertarian, but their ideas are different and they're not right. So, we, we say classical liberal philosophy. You know, the, minimum, the uh, small government, low taxes, free trade, individual rights, and entrepreneurship. So, in our programs, we teach the basics and the history of libertarian thinking and free market economics and entrepreneurship. We also have workshops about how to use these ideas in real life, like starting a business. Our standard program is what we call a Liberty Camp, or Liberty English Camp, or sometimes Liberty Entrepreneurship Camp. And sometimes we just say Entrepreneurship Camp because in some countries where we go, uh, the word liberty is dangerous. So we talk about it, but we don't advertise it that way. We advertise job creation and youth opportunity. What it really is, is a Liberty Camp. <laughs> so, uh, this is normally five days, five days and nights. We have a group of 30 to 40 young people, uh, college age students, and we go to some nice place in the mountains or by the sea, and we spend the time together 
practicing English, discussing libertarian ideas, and having workshops. Sometimes we have short programs, two hours, three hours, four hours, one day. But our normal program is a five-day liberty camp. And we have some wonderful people here among us who have been to a liberty camp. Yay, yay, yeah. In fact, Ken has been doing this longer than me. I'm uh, relatively new for this. Uh, but at this point, in 10 years, we've had uh, programs, more than 50 programs, in 24 countries. Uh, in August, we will go to country number 25, which will be Kenya. And there's a list of the countries which you can't really read. Sorry about that. Uh, now, um, I'm just going to show the slides but not say anything. And I hope that Andy will, will come and uh, make some comments. But I, I think you can see we, uh, we did our first, our first programs in Lithuania. And those actually started before Andy and I got involved. Uh, Ken was part of this and Virgis. Uh, probably some of you know Virgis. Uh, they have uh, Lee, Ken Lee. Uh, they were doing these programs in Lithuania before Andy and I started. Andy and I got involved in 2004. We incorporated in 2005. And what we did is um, start, we said, this is really fantastic. What you guys are doing is fantastic. We want to do this in other countries. So Andy and I did not invent this concept. Virgis and Ken and Lee and Ken Lee and some of our other friends actually invented this concept of a liberty camp. What Andy and I did was figure out how to, it kind of like franchising, we, we figured out how to open new camps in new countries. So Virgis is still involved in Lithuania every year, he, he has programs, but Andy and I are going to new places. And our last one was in Greece. Uh, okay, I will maybe come back to this. Uh, Andy wanted to tell you uh, more about our history and our programs. And you can see it's all totally serious. Just, just like this week is. Uh, and this is coming up. Uh, next week, from here, uh, four of us are going to India. We're going to do a five-day liberty camp in India. Venkatesh is in the background. Hey, stand up. He is our organizer in India. Yay. <laughs> and David will go. David, yay. Uh, and Andy and I will, will go to India. And in August, we're going to, our, to Kenya for the first time and have a five-day camp. We will also, I think, we'll, we're going to try to go to Uganda and go to some small villages and have short seminars in the villages for, um, for media and for uh, teachers, professors, for uh, maybe, maybe politicians, but opinion leaders. So that will be different. It's not students that we're trying to reach in Uganda. It's the opinion leaders in the smaller towns and they have elections coming, and we think it's important to try to reach out into, you know, away from the big universities, away from the capital cities, and try to reach uh, people who don't normally have programs like this, and just spread the word. And at the end of August, we will go to Ukraine for our second time, and have a, a, a liberty camp in the forest and the mountains in Ukraine. And Anytime you all, anytime you you want to know what we're doing, where we're going, please go to our website. There's a, an events page, and if you want to come, you're always welcome. Just send me a note. Say, hey, Glenn, I want to come. <laughs> okay, I can't give you a plane ticket, but you know we'll make sure that you can come and bring your friends. Really reasonable price, and we will probably involve you in discussion groups with the students because you probably know more about libertarian ideas than they do, and your English is probably a bit better. So I hope I will see you at some of these programs. Thank you. Okay, now my colleague Glenn will speak. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Andy, your slides are really strange.
Let me see if I can find my slide. Okay, so now, um, I, this looks like it's going to work better. Now, uh, I would like to ask you, just stop and think for a moment, maybe close your eyes, and re think back to the time, to the event in your life, when you realized that you were not alone. What do you mean, Glenn? What do you mean? When I was... But you know what I mean. There was a point in your life, or up to a point, you thought you were the only one in the world who had these crazy ideas about freedom. There was no one else. You didn't know anyone else. The ideas maybe were not well formed, but you, had, you, you knew you were different, philosophically, or you know, in terms of your thinking, your, maybe your values. But maybe you couldn't express it, and you couldn't define it. And then something happened. Something happened, and you discovered that you were not alone. Who remembers that? You remember that moment? For some of us, it was a long time ago. <laughs> but I know that moment was there. For some people, some people were really lucky because they grew up and they, they grew up with, like Ken Lee. Ken Lee probably never had a moment like that. I'm sure she didn't, because she grew up in a libertarian family. So maybe, maybe some of, of you, you younger ones, also, like Ken Lee, grew up surrounded by libertarian thought. And this is fantastic because it means we're making progress. But for most people, especially we older ones, uh, there, there was a, a moment in life when you discovered you're not alone, and that was so fantastic that we can remember it to this day, a hundred years later. Okay, 90 years later. Uh, just for me, really, really quick, I, I can think of three moments that really stand out. The first was when I read Ayn Rand. I was in university, and I went, oh my God. I can't believe this. I found someone who can express what I've always thought and I've always felt, but I could never say this. I could never, I hadn't worked it out. I didn't know how to think. But Ayn Rand helped me to organize my thinking. She didn't revolutionize, sorry, did not revolutionize my ideas or my values, but she helped me uh, sort, sort them out and make them consistent and make them logical and help me to explain them to other people. A few years later, I read the, the, the works of Harry Brown, newsletters and books of Harry Brown. Uh, does anybody know about Harry Brown today? I know many of you know about Ayn Rand. Uh, so, but um, in 1980, more or less, I read the, the books of Harry Brown, and I said, wow, he explains things that Ayn Rand didn't explain, like how to get along with your wife, or how to find a roommate, or how to find a job. How, I mean, how to live a libertarian life in a world that's full of non-libertarians. How to live free in an unfree world. So this is another big moment for me. And the third, and possibly most important, is when I discovered International Society for Individual Liberty, which is exactly 25 years ago. Can you believe that? San Francisco. And the difference, the, the, the reason that was different is because until that point, by 1990, I had many, many libertarian friends and objectivist friends, but they were all Americans. They all lived in the same city as me, more or less. What I discovered with ISIL is the international, and that was very, very rare in those days. That was unique, as far as I know. The only organization that was truly international, and at the conferences, as you see, you meet wonderful people of all ages and all backgrounds and all languages and all countries and you're together for a week and you develop a huge extended family of fantastic people. 
And that was a huge change in my life because I already knew I wasn't alone. But after joining ISIL, I joined an international family. So my world exploded. My world became, you know, my, my little world became a, a really big world. And all of my activities and my projects and most of my relationships have come from this network. My friendships, my business, my projects, my roommate, lots of... So, those were my, my moments. Why are we talking about this? Because a primary objective of our Liberty Camps is to create that moment for new people. The people who, most of the people who come to our Liberty Camps have felt alone. They felt like, maybe not 100%, but they have felt very strongly that they were different, that they were alone. They didn't have libertarian friends. They weren't sure what libertarian ideas mean. Their families thought they were crazy. Their friends thought they were crazy. Maybe your friends think you're crazy. Mine used to, but then they gave up. <laughs> so, at our Liberty Camps, we try to recreate this very special feeling. And I know Neil and David and Ken and Venkatesh and, uh, and some of our other friends here like Pavel, uh, they can tell you, and Walter, uh, they, can, they can tell you that this happens. And they probably have stories of conversations with some of our friends, maybe from Eastern Europe, maybe from Central Asia, maybe from Africa. People, they, they say things like, we didn't know people like you existed. These are, so at each of our camps, we have wonderful memories and wonderful moments like this. Now I want to show you some photos of some wonderful individuals whom we work with. In each country where we go, we work with a local partner. And that, yeah, so in India, Venkatesh is our local partner. In Kazakhstan, we worked with Pavel. Uh, in, in each country, the local partner is responsible for finding the location and for or finding the students and managing the money. You know, collect money from students or sponsors and then pay the bills. And my responsibility is to put together a team of teachers and also to raise money in the West, uh, mostly in America, uh, to raise money to pay for our plane tickets. That's our biggest expense. In Africa, our primary local partner is Adedayo. Adedayo is actually from Nigeria but he's very active in organizations in Africa, especially English-speaking Africa, the former British colonies in Africa. He has extensive networks, and he helps us organize our camps in Africa. So last December, we went to Uganda, and I'll just, I'm not going to try to explain every slide, but these are the people that we work with, our local organizers uh, and some of our teachers, I'll try to give you an idea of the, the atmosphere at a camp. Look at that white face. Hi. Andy and I were the only ones. I want to tell you a story about what some of our students, two of our students had just been released from jail. <clears throat> Why did they go to jail? Well, they, they were part of a group. They, fa they found a group that they called the Jobless Brotherhood. Now, what they're really doing is, what they're, they're upset about is government policies that keep people unemployed. And I probably don't have to explain to you what that means. But to organize protests and to get the support of a large number of people, they don't say it that way. What they say is, it's the Jobless Brotherhood, because half the population is unemployed, so they get the support of half the population, more or less, especially young people. So Jobless Brotherhood is not just libertarians. It's being led by these young libertarians. And they decided to have a protest at a government ministry. Uh, this is not the ministry, I think that's a church. But what they did, uh, these are pigs. These are live pigs. And they painted them. Can you see the colors? They, they painted here two that are yellow and two that are green. And those are the colors of the ruling party. 
And the pig, of course, like maybe in our cultures, is a symbol of corruption and waste and greed. You know, the pig will eat anything, even if he's not hungry. So their argument is, you know, the polit this is very symbolic. The politicians will grab, they'll eat all the money, whether they need it or not. And, and they'll waste a lot of it. So the Jobless Brotherhood wanted to protest the corruption and the taxes and the crazy spending and the bad priorities. So they painted the pigs in the color of the ruling party and they went to the parliament building and they went inside. I think, you know, parliament buildings everywhere, they have security, they have guards, they have guns, but these guys somehow managed to get past all this into the parliament chambers and have their demonstration. Well, they were arrested. Now, some of you or all of you are going, well, yeah, Glenn, what do you expect? I mean, you know, you're trespassing, you're breaking laws, you're, you're uh, uh, bypassing security, what do you expect? You know, they're, they're trespassing, right? They're violating property rights. They, they deserve to go to jail. But I think the question we want to ask is, and, and they knew that. They knew that would happen to them. But they were so upset about their conditions that they were willing to risk going to jail to attract the media attention and to make their points. Uh, here's a, a group of the Muslim Brotherhood, and I think they're in the courtroom here. I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know if you can take a picture in the courtroom, but it kind of looks like they're on trial here. <laughs> And the, the man between Andy and me is Augustine, one of the leaders of the Brotherhood. And he came to our, he joined our group on the fourth day, um, just the day before he had been released from jail. And here's one of his jobless brothers, Jeremy. Uh, and this is our, our group eating dinner. And he too had just come from jail where he hadn't had any food for days. So he ate about three meals. He's a small guy, and, but he was very, very hungry. He also didn't have much sleep. When he was released from jail, he tried to go home, and his parents said, you can't, you can't live here. We, we, you, you're causing too much trouble. You're, you're exposing the entire family to trouble. So you can't, you can't live here. He had classes the next day. In fact, it was the last week, and they had exams and the university wouldn't allow him to enter. He was thrown out of the university, thrown out of his home. We are his only friends. Anyway, um, this is part of what inspires me to do this job, is to meet fantastic people like, like these guys, and to work with them, and to try to help them learn the philosophy, learn the arguments, practice the arguments about spreading freedom. After Uganda, we went to Ethiopia, and our partner here is Kidus. Uh, Kidus is, well, he's roughly the age of most of you. He's in his, I don't know if he's 25 yet, but he's rough, more or less uh, out, uh, 25. And uh, he organized a, a, a one-day seminar for us in a university town 200 miles north of Addis Ababa. He chose that place because he thought maybe the government wouldn't notice. You know, if you have if you have meetings, big meetings in the capital city, under their nose, they get very nervous. Uh, again, they have elections coming up too. They just had the elections. Guess what the outcome was? The ruling party won every single seat in parliament. Big surprise. But anyway, this is last December before the elections. And the ruling, the, uh, the parties, the uh, politicians, were, it, it's not illegal to have a meeting. It's not illegal to have a conference. But you, have, you need permission. And you have to register. You have to tell them what you want to do, and where, and why, and how many people. And then you have to do what you, if they approve it, you have to, you know, you have to do what you say. So Kiddush went and said, hey, we're going to have a liberty camp. Uh, no, wait, we're, we're going to have um, entrepreneurship. Job creation, youth empowerment. Yeah, okay, no problem. But in this university town, somehow this didn't happen. We weren't registered. I, th I guess he thought that the risk was small. And we had our meeting. 
we expected 30 students. We had nearly 100 because of the word spread. You know, at lunch, they all told their friends, hey, you got to come to this. This is really, really good. After lunch, there were nearly 100 students. Uh, that's a white man's leg over there. Guess who? It's the guy with crazy slides. Uh, yeah, so, you know, there were no seats. We were sitting on the ground, on the rocks, on the, like you used to do in Lithuania. Huh? <laughs> so, you know, an interesting group, very interesting group of people. And they say they could understand us, but they were reluctant to speak. They don't get much practice speaking, uh, but they said they could understand us. But what we didn't know is that the police noticed this. <laughs> Here's a group of 100 students meeting in this outdoor cafe. What's going on? So they came and they investigated. And when it was over, they arrested some of the students. They arrested the taxi driver who took us to our hotel. They kept them for 24 hours. They were not treated badly, other than being arrested with no charge. But the, the local police wanted to know, what's going on? What are you doing? Probably the only reason Andy and I weren't arrested is because, you know, we're all white guys speaking English. So it was clear the, the authorities didn't understand what we were doing, but it was clear that we were not opposition politicians. So they, they left us alone. Uh, Kidus eventually had to pay them, pay money to the police to have these young people released. So uh, I think most of us, not everyone, some of you are from oppressive cultures and you, you probably have some interesting and maybe very sad stories of your own. Uh, I know our friends from North Korea have stories that are much worse than this. But what I want, I want you to know is that there are people like you fighting for freedom in all over the world and sometimes under dangerous conditions. Uh, and, and in uh, unfriendly territory. So, hey, you're smiling about this one. <laughs> in uh, February, we met Kidus in Hyderabad, where he lives, and he had organized a, a visit uh, to six cities where we did nine seminars. So, n not a five day camp. Next week will be a five day camp. It will be over here in uh, Vizag. Vizag. But February, we had a uh, one day programs. And every evening we would get, up, get on the bus or get up in a car and go to the next city. And each day we had a, a seminar. And we, we don't... Yay, there he is. Uh, now, I have only good stories about India. This was a fantastic, fantastic trip. The organization was superb. The uh, response was unbelievable, totally supportive. No problems at all with the police. In fact, in one town, we met the local police commissioner, who is an objectivist and libertarian, and we had lunch in his home. So it was the opposite of Ethiopia. Uh, it was a, a wonderful reception. We held our seminars at uh, colleges, business colleges, engineering colleges. We were hosted by the administrators, the, uh, the president or the dean of the university, professors, somebody spent a lot of time blowing balloons for us. They gave us red carpet treatment, literally a red carpet on the floor. They even put, these are all flowers. They made these letters out of fresh flowers. Free enterprise. I've never seen anything like it. It was just really amazing. And I'm, I'm very, very eager to go back to India many, many times, I hope. And I hope you will all come too. Meet some incredible people. And they are very, very, very open. Very, uh, you know, they're they're thinking about reform. How can we change? How can we improve India? How can we improve our lives? How can we learn new ideas? How can we find jobs or create jobs? So I think we have a lot of opportunity. Maybe we have the same opportunity in uh, in Indonesia. It seems like there are some very good start here. Uh, good uh, networks. They honored us with, uh, you know, a, a scarf, and uh, it was really, really beautiful. And finally, uh, I'll tell you about, who's this guy? 
Who's that white? <laughs> that old white guy from England. <laughs> Our, our new uh, partner in Ukraine is Vlad. Uh, we met Vlad a year ago at our camp in Malta. He came to another one in Italy and another one in, in Czech Republic. And he said, I've got to devote my life to spreading freedom. I'm going to organize events in Ukraine. And he's now busy doing, he was 19 years old. He's now 20. And he's a busy, he's from the East. And you know, that's not such a good place. It's a good place to be from now, not a good place to be. Uh, his family has lost businesses and property, and uh, so uh, Vlad is busy, and he uh, he's going to organize another camp in August. So this was our first time in Lviv. And there's a picture of Vlad. Not such a good picture there. We have, uh, this was uh, four days, our, our meeting was four days. We have debates and we have uh, some parties and we have um, small discussion groups. We have lectures, videos. And we had to take time to make a special trip to go to see the home of Ludwig von Mises. Your favorite, anybody's favorite? Von Mises, okay. So we found his home, took a picture. Everybody's wondering, what are these guys doing? Who is this? So maybe some of you have had another special moment in your life where you've said, and I know this is true for us older guys, where you say, okay, I've had enough talk. It's time to do something. Let's, let's, let's have some action. Let's, let's do something to spread the, these ideas. What can you do? That inspiration came to me from attending ISIL conferences in the mid-90s and from meeting, from getting to know Ken and Virgis and some of and our other friends. Uh, they were already doing things. And I said, what, what can I do? And my answer is liberty camps. That's my thing. That's my thing. I'm an organizer, I'm a teacher, I raise money. Uh, I recruit teachers, I plan the travel, I do all these things, I find them. And, but the most important thing I do is to find local partners like Venkatesh and develop them and help them uh, build their networks and their skills so that they can develop networks and they can operate camps and other activities. So if any of you in, in your countries, if you would like to organize an event like this, I'm there to help you. I want to work with you. So see me this week, write to me later, ping me on Facebook, but let's, let's talk, let's work together. So if you're motivated to do something, some of you are in Students for Liberty, right? Probably, or, or thinking about it, it's new in Asia, but uh, Students for Liberty, that's something you can do. Uh, we work closely with them, but our activities are somewhat separate. And, I mean, we have different purposes. Uh, generally, we're all spreading freedom. But we love to work with students for liberty. So, uh, so join us. Uh, be a teacher. Some of, some of you are already. You, you come and you teach at our camps. Uh, be a teacher. Be a local partner. Send your friends, your students. And we always, maybe some of you would be interested in supporting us financially. We always have a need for this. Uh, all our people are volunteers. They donate their time. Sometimes they pay for their own plane ticket. Sometimes I have to help them. I have to raise money to help them. But uh, we don't take tax dollars. We don't look for tax money and we don't receive tax money. So we rely on volunteers and we rely on private donations from, uh, from foundations, from individuals. And every dollar is important. Our dollars go a long way in the developing world. We can get, get a, lot, a lot of leverage for our money. And one result of this is not only meeting hundreds or thousands of students, but it's meeting new camp organizers, new local partners. And that's how we grow. So every dollar that comes to us is multiplied and has a, a very, very, very big effect. Uh, ISIL has been a, a source of support to us for a long time. 
there are some individuals in the in our group here today who have not only given a lot of their time, but they've given money too, and we're very grateful to all that. And I just leave you with a thought. It's almost 5:30. I'll leave you with some words that some of you will find familiar, and these are words that we leave with all of our students at the end of every program. We talk about Hayek, one of my favorites, uh, and we leave them with the idea that of the, the liberal utopia. Hayek challenges us to dream about what's possible, and don't compromise that. Let the politicians worry about the compromises, but imagine a new liberal utopia. Make the building of a free society once more an intellectual adventure, a deed of courage. <clears throat> and we leave them with the, the words of Ayn Rand, another dear favorite of mine, as you know. The world you desire can be won. It exists. It is real. It is possible. It is yours. And I want to work with you. So thank you very much.